Good day, folks. Pastor Jim Thomas from the Village Chapel here in Nashville, Tennessee, with your daily devotional. Read in just a minute from Bringing Us to Glory by David Gooding. Uh, Dr. Gooding was professor of Old Testament Greek at Queen's University, Belfast, and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. And I have really enjoyed this uh, 365 daily readings for the Christian journey. He's uh, going to reference Luke chapter 9 in that reading. And so I thought I'd read the passage for us first. It describes um, uh, some of what happened as Jesus is making his journey to the cross. And we often are thinking about such things uh, during the season of Lent, for instance, in the church calendar year. And here's uh, just a little snapshot of what uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 43, on down through verse 50. Let's stop there, okay? Uh, The folks are amazed at the greatness of God. He's been doing some miracles. And uh, so Luke records how the the crowds are just, you know, being astonished at the greatness of God through the power uh, that is is on display through the miracles Jesus is performing. Everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did. And then he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you, the son of man, and that's Jesus most often use self-reference, his own uh, uh, description of himself that comes right out of Daniel chapter seven. It's a messianic title, the son of man. And any first century Jew would have understood that as his his disciples indeed would have. But he says, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand, Luke says, they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it and they were afraid to ask him about it. And so the timidity there of the disciples is preventing them from something that Jesus wants them to know. He tells them repeatedly that he's going to be uh, delivered over into the hands of the religious leaders. They're gonna arrest him. Uh, He's going to suffer, he's going to die. And he he even predicts that he will rise again. And yet the disciples are a little bit timid to ask questions. I wanna encourage you, don't ever be timid to ask questions. God's not afraid of your questions or my questions. And having questions is actually quite normal. Um, We need not think that we're sinning if we have questions or if we have even doubts. It might just be a sign that we're actually thinking. And I think that's actually really good. And the truth always will surface at some point. Uh, But they did not understand what this meant that Jesus was saying to them. Uh, It was hidden from them and they didn't grasp it and they were afraid to ask him about it. And then an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. See, they're thinking, Jesus is going downtown. He's going to Jerusalem. They're thinking he's, he's going to serve some, you know, so, some military purpose or some sociological salvation for the nation of Israel. That He's going to overturn the Roman government, the oppressive you know, regime there. And he's, he's, he's going to you know, set them all free that way. And he's going to be their king. And then each one of them might become the greatest or one of his, one of his uh, lieutenants in some way, right? So Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had that child stand beside him. And he said to them, these disciples, who are arguing about who's the greatest, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For he who is least among you all, he is the greatest. (laughs) I love the way Jesus often said things that sound upside down and inside out and paradoxical. Whoever is the least among you all is the greatest. Master, said John, he's one of the disciples obviously, We saw a man driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. And Jesus said, do not stop him for whoever is not against you is for you. All right, so that's from Luke chapter nine, verses 43 to 50. Let's see what Dr. David Gooding has to say from bringing us to glory. This is really 
And he, he titles this writing, uh, The Wisdom of the Cross. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, verse 44. So Gooding says, While then everyone was still amazed at the tremendous acts of power which Christ was performing, that's in that first verse I read, verse 43, Christ impressed upon his apostles that he who was doing these powerful deeds would eventually be delivered up into the hands of men. The apostles did not understand what he said. In the first place, they did not apparently understand to what being delivered up into the hands of men referred. And they were afraid to ask. Was it because they were subconsciously afraid of what the answer might be? And then the phrase itself seemed to imply weakness and helplessness. And it probably did not make sense to them that someone who could wield the supernatural power that Christ was wielding would be delivered into the hands of men as though completely unable to save himself. Luke explains that it was not altogether their fault that they could not understand the lesson. Quote, it was concealed from them so that they should not perceive it, verse 45 says. Dr. Gooding goes on to say, when Christ was arrested, condemned and crucified, they saw all too clearly what it meant and saw it with shock and consternation. In a world that worshiped power, to be crucified was the extreme of disgrace and shameful weakness. And a crucified Messiah seemed an absurd contradiction in terms. Later, they came to see and admire the divine wisdom of the strategy of the cross. They saw that mere power is inadequate to change a man's heart, to reconcile a person to God, to change their rebellion into faith and love and obedience. And inadequate, therefore, to solve the human problem and bring in the kingdom of God. And then they saw that the cross, with all its apparent weakness and shame, was able to do what power by itself could not do. The weakness of God is stronger than men, the Apostle Paul would later write in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. They saw, too, that Christ's suffering on the cross was not an unfortunate obstacle on Christ's path to glory. He had come down from glory deliberately in order to suffer the cross. The cross was an expression of the wisdom of the majestic glory. And then they woke up to the fact that the message of the cross is the only message of any use in the evangelization of the world. And the principle of the cross, the only safe principle to follow in the organization and running of the church. Now, I need to read that again as a pastor, that last sentence, okay? They woke up to the fact that the message of the cross is the only message of any use in the evangelization of the world. In other words, if we go out into the world and we want to persuade people that the gospel is true, the greatest way to do that is the same way Jesus came, and that's he came to serve. Not to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life for us. And so when we go out and we go out to share the gospel, the question behind everyone else's question when they question us about the gospel is, the God, is does the God that you believe in and you want to persuade me to believe in, does that God love me? That's so important. The disciples woke up to the fact that the message of the cross is the only message of any use in the evangelization of the world. And then this last part is what got me as a pastor. And the message of the cross is the only message or the only principle of the cross. The principle of the cross is the only safe principle to follow in the organization and running of the church. In other words, the church 
is not here to see people coming, streaming in as some kind of a consumer base. No, the church is here to serve. We're here to serve our neighborhoods. We're here to serve our cities. We're here to serve our nation and the world. And especially all of those who don't believe yet that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And the best way to communicate the reality, the truth of the gospel is for the church to follow the principle of the cross in its organization and operation. Oh, man. May the Lord uh, uh, work that into my heart, into our hearts together, uh, wherever you may be listening from or, or watching from, whatever church you might go to. And certainly if you come to the Village Chapel, let's intend, let's purpose this week to place ourselves before God, to offer ourselves back to him that he might use us in any way he sees fit to serve his purposes, the glory of Jesus, and to serve the unfolding plan of God right here in Nashville and wherever you may be listening or watching from uh, as, the, as the gospel unfolds in your neighborhood and our neighborhood. May the Lord uh, use us to serve his purposes and his plans. Amen, amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the cross. Mm. Thank you that the Christian faith uh, doesn't use the symbol of scales, that its symbol is the cross. That we're not just struggling to balance out the scales of how many good things we've done and how many bad things we've No, no, no. Lord Jesus, you came, you laid down your life for us. Now uh, use us any way you see fit, Lord, to lay down our lives, to serve others and to serve your purposes and your plans in the unfolding of your kingdom here on earth. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. And amen. God bless you. This podcast is a resource of the Village Chapel in Nashville, Tennessee. Don't forget to also subscribe to one of our other podcasts, Curate's Corner with Kim Thomas. Every Friday throughout the season of Lent, join Kim as she looks at the story of Jesus' last week as told through classic art, prayers, and scriptures. You can subscribe to her podcast on all major platforms, including the Village Chapel YouTube channel, and you can find accompanying resources at lent.thevillagechapel.com. If you find this daily devotional beneficial, leave a review and share it with friends and family. For more resources or to support our ministry, visit our website, thevillagechapel.com. Artwork for this podcast by Kim Thomas, music by Phil Kagey.